Hello and welcome to our presentation today regarding the business of fidelity underwriting. Our presentation involves two main parts today. The first part will discuss the information and documents an underwriter collects and uses in order to evaluate a risk and what is maintained in the underwriting file. The second part of our discussion will deal with how that information can be used in a claim or dispute scenario by various individuals such as the insured, the broker, or the insurer. As part of our discussion, we are going to go over a variety of topics including what we've determined to be the art and science of fidelity underwriting, some key considerations and process that the underwriter makes, obtaining and using the underwriting file in both the claim scenario and litigation, and rescission. Underwriting has been described as the foundation of insurance. It is a uh, critical aspect to the business. Uh, it's, it's what I refer to as a gatekeeper function. The underwriter and the underwriting process determine what risks come into the market to make sure they're appropriate risk and what prices those risks maintain. Uh, if that gets out of balance or out of whack, it could have a, a de detrimental effect on the insurer and also on the entire insurance market. The key person in all of this is the insurance underwriter. So Tracy, can you tell us a little bit about the insurance underwriter and some of the, the roles that person has? Sure. Uh, the, the underwriter really kicks things off with accepting an application and taking a look at what the insured or the applicant has put on the application. They have a couple of choices at that point. They can look at the risk, look at the application and the information that was provided with it look at the premium and see if the premium is, is worthy of the risk, the balance is, is healthy for them, and accept the risk and write the bond or the policy. Second, they can look at the application and decide they need more information and go back to the applicant and ask more questions. If they don't like the answers to the questions that they hear, they have several things in their tool belt that they can use. They can limit the scope of coverage by using some exclusionary endorsements. They can limit the limit of liability and offer less coverage. If there's things they're uncomfortable uncomfortable with, they can sublimit the coverage or, or offer that portion that they're not comfortable with at a smaller limit. They can also change the premium for the risk. If they look at it and say, yeah, it's, it's, it's a little bit riskier than I thought, they can increase the premium or they can increase the retention so that the burn layer is a little bit farther for them to, to have a loss. And then their third choice is they can just decline the, the risk altogether and say it's out of appetite and move on. So the submission of the application is really what kicks it off and it's the underwriter's um, responsibility to, to read the, the submission and the application material and make sure that all of the questions are answered, that there's no ambiguity in the answers. If anything is left blank, they need to go back and ask the applicant to fill that out. An insurer's duty to inquire is extremely important. Not only should an insurer ensure that it has a complete application from the perspective insured, but it is also vitally important that the insurer follow up with the prospective insured and or the broker concerning the inadequacy of any answers. And a failure to do so by the insurer uh, could result in the insurer being charged with constructive notice of that omitted information. And it's also possible the insurer could have waived its right to rescind that policy. Now, Tracy, what other significant documents may you find in the underwriting file? The underwriting file has got some things that the claim person or the outside claims attorney would want to look for. In addition to the application that I, and already, spoke, that I already spoke about, um, there might be supplemental applications for things like social engineering fraud or um, electronic signatures, things like that, that we need to get some more information about. There also might be some waivers in the underwriting file. One example of a waiver is when an agent or broker asks us to waive um, something that an applicant did that might make them unbondable. For example, an applicant might reveal that they stole a sandwich when they were in college and they got arrested for it. Now that's nothing that would make them a bad employee now, enough time has passed and there haven't been any other infractions on their record, but um, it could, it's something that could be used in a prior knowledge of dishonesty situation to deny coverage if that employee did, ever did anything dishonest. So what the underwriter will do if they're going to accept that, that incidence, they will write a letter back to the agent or broker and say that we will not use that termination provision to deny coverage for this one particular incident and that incident alone. In the context of a pre-suit claim, an underwriting file can be a very important tool for a claims professional and an attorney uh, for the insurer. 
The underwriting file can show the claims professional, the nature of the insurance business operations, the insurance prior loss history, as well as the nature of the insured risk. Reviewing a well-developed underwriting file during a pre-suit claim will also allow claims professionals to assess and evaluate the strengths and weaknesses of potential coverage defenses, and also identify important key witnesses that may have relevant information concerning that dispute. And in the context of litigation, opposing parties routinely seek the production of the underwriting file during the course of litigation. And routinely, insurers will object to those requests on several grounds, one of which is relevancy. The courts throughout the country find that the underwriting file is discoverable in the event that one of the issues in the case concerns ambiguous policy terms or claims of bad faith. However, other courts have found that in the absence of one of those claims or allegations, an underwriting file may be irrelevant and not discoverable. Our last topic is rescission or the avoidance of a fidelity bond. Rescission is one of the most powerful tools in the insurer's armory. It can be, it's a very necessary and powerful weapon that the insurer can use to prevent it from paying an unjust claim. But they make no mistake, rescission is a drastic remedy. We on our panel have called it the nuclear option. Because what happens if rescission is successful, the policy is void ab initio, meaning from the beginning. So it's just the policy never existed. The insurance transaction is completely unwound. In order to have a rescission claim and be successful at it, it needs four elements. There must be an application. There must be a material or an untrue statement in the application. That statement must be material in that it must affect how the insurance underwriter looked at the claim. For example, would the insurance underwriter have priced the claim differently if he or she had known the old truth about the claim? And lastly, the material misrepresentation must be relevant to the issue that's at issue in the coverage by matter. Thank you very much for listening to us today. It has been a pleasure speaking with you. We look forward to seeing you.